Welcome everyone to our K-State Gardening Hour this afternoon. We're ready to get started. <clears throat> so thank you for attending our second Gardening Hour hosted by K-State Research and Extension. I'm Rebecca McMahon, a horticulture agent with uh, K-State Research and Extension in Cedric County. This webinar series was founded to provide extension education for horticulture and gardening to the public in Kansas. And everyone involved in the development of this series is working with extension through Kansas State. Most of us have a background in horticulture or a related discipline. Uh, most of all, we have a love of horticulture, gardening, and the environment. Each week we have a different topic. So this week's topic is taking care of tomatoes. And our hope is to meet the needs of both new gardeners as well as experienced gardeners. You can find additional topics on our website and we will be putting that link into the chat. You can also find the list of upcoming topics on that web page as well as the K-State Horticulture and Natural Resources Facebook page. Uh, be sure to like, share, and use hashtag K-State Garden Hour to help promote the series. Before we do get started with our speakers today, we have a couple of housekeeping notes. If you haven't done so already, we ask that you keep your mics muted for the presentation uh, just to help eliminate background noise. With a lot of folks on the Zoom, we can have pretty bad background noise if we don't do that. And we want to make sure everyone has a great experience. Uh, it may also be in your best interest to keep your video turned off uh, because that can help with overall connectivity and uh, internet connection quality. Our moderator today in our Zoom room is Pam Paulson, an extension agent in Reno County. If you have questions throughout the presentation, please go ahead and put those into the chat box. Um, you can send them privately to the moderator if you don't want your questions to be public. And uh, we will be keeping track of those questions and then there will be an optional Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Some of us that are <clears throat> um, in the, the room as co-hosts, we'll be working to answer some of those questions in the chat as well. We do have two speakers today, <clears throat> and our first speaker is Tom Buller, a horticulture extension agent in Douglas County, who will be discussing general tomato care and maintenance. When he's finished, uh, please bear with us for a couple seconds as we transition to our second speaker, uh, Dr. Judy O'Mara with our Plant Pathology Diagnostic Clinic, who will be talking about tomato diseases. So again, please be patient as we do that a uh, little bit of transition in the middle of the hour. And we do ask, um, we will be holding all of the questions for the Q&A until the end of both presentations. So with that, Tom, uh, you can go ahead and share your screen and get started when you're ready. All right, thank you. So my name is Tom Buller. I'm the horticulture extension agent in Douglas County. Um, as you can see, one year for Halloween, I dressed up like a tomato. I really like tomatoes. Uh, my background, um, prior to becoming a horticulture extension agent, I spent about 15 years uh, in commercial vegetable production. Um, so grew quite a few tomatoes back in the day. Um, and so that, uh, we'll take us to our next slide. So this is a K-State Research and Extension uh, presentation. And we just like to remind everyone that K-State Research and Extension is a public program and we don't discriminate in the provision of services to anyone. So this is open for everyone. All right, so we will jump right ahead to taking care of tomatoes. And this is just gonna be kind of my overview of what I'm gonna talk about. Um, we're gonna talk about a lot of things. Um, to give Judy time, I'm not gonna probably go in as much depth as some of you would like on any of these topics, um, but we will have some time for questions at the end. Um, so please, if you have questions, uh, type those into the chat. Uh, maybe some of my colleagues can answer those as we uh, move through the presentation, um, but if not, hopefully we get time to answer those at the end. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the different types of tomatoes. Uh, we'll go through that really briefly. I'm not gonna talk about tomato variety selection. Um, that could be a, a whole talk in and of itself, um, but at this point in the season, maybe you've chosen your tomatoes and we're gonna spend our time really focusing on how to care for those. Uh, but I will talk a little bit about types because that will inform some of our care. Uh, talk about fertilization. I noticed a number of questions about that showing up in the chat already before I started. Um, talk about watering tomatoes, best practices in that regard. Um, talk about providing tomatoes support. That is something uh, that they do appreciate. 
um, talk about pruning, uh, which is something maybe people don't do as much as they should. Uh, hopefully give you some hints to get started on that. Um, we'll talk about mulching, which is a great practice. Um, talk a little bit about harvest, uh, just because uh, there are some things people often don't know about harvesting tomatoes uh, that might be useful. Talk a little bit about pest control. Um, we won't have time to dive into to how to control every single pest. Um, and we'll talk about some common problems. And likewise, we won't have a time to solve all of those. Uh, but throughout my talk, I hope to be pointing you all towards some resources. Uh, I do have some links to K-State publications in my slideshow. Um, those links should also be posted in the chat, um, but you can also look at the, the horticulture information page. They've got links to a lot of great publications from K-State. All right, so with that, I will go ahead and jump on into my presentation. We'll talk about tomato types. Um, and this we could spend a lot of time talking about uh, because there's a lot of different terms that get thrown around. Um, heirloom versus hybrid tomatoes is one that's uh, really common. Um, so heirlooms are sometimes called open pollinated tomatoes, um, are tomatoes that have been sort of bred over time uh, versus hybrids, which are a very specific cross of tomato types um, to yield uh, a very specific type of tomato uh, with sort of managed characteristics. Now those hybrids, if you save seeds from those, um, you don't really know what you're going to get next year. So they don't come true to type. An heirloom, most likely you will get a tomato pretty much like that heirloom you picked it off of. Um, so those are, are really common types. Um, I'm not going to talk about seed saving in any more depth, um, but if you do have hybrid tomatoes, unless you want a garden experiment, um, not really something to save seeds from. Some other terms that get thrown around a lot with tomatoes um, are based sort of more on the form of the fruit. So we have what we call slicers, and that might be what you see on the top right there. Uh, Beefsteak form is a common sort of shape for heirloom tomatoes. Uh, got some larger size, a little bit flatter, some big indentations. Uh, sometimes you'll hear saladette, which are just kind of small, small round tomatoes, uh, you know, sized for a slicing up or putting on a, a salad. Um, you hear about plum or Roma tomatoes. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about those later on just because they do have some specific challenges, maybe more so than other tomatoes. Um, but uh, those are a little bit drier, uh, less moisture content, so they're good for cooking or sauce making. Uh, grape tomatoes, you know, these are little tomatoes that are uh, shaped like a grape, not surprisingly, um, and cherry tomatoes. So, you know, all sorts of different shapes of tomatoes, um, hundreds of different varieties in each of those shapes. So lots of different things to choose from. In general, however, um, most of what we say here, except for the, the hair, heirloom versus hybrid distinction, uh, you know, the sort of shape of tomato doesn't manage, make a lot of difference in how we manage it. Um, what does man make a difference in, in how we manage our tomato plants is um, what we call their sort of growing typology. Uh, so all tomatoes, you know, they start out this time of year, they're in a vegetative growth stage. Those plants are focused on growing leaves and stems. And at some point in the season, um, they will make a transition to a reproductive growth stage where they're setting out flowers, putting on fruit, and focusing more of their energy in production of that fruit. Um, and there's really two types of tomatoes or two broad classifications, I guess, of how they make that transition. Um, so the first type um, is an indeterminate tomato. And this is going to be most of your heirloom types. Most of your cherry tomatoes are indeterminates. Um, but you can also get red slicers that are indeterminates. Um, so these are plants that really uh, keep a lot of uh, focus on that vegetative growth stage throughout the entirety of their life. So these plants are going to keep growing more leaves and stems uh, until around here a frost will kill them. Um, they do also, you know, start growing fruit, um, but these are going to be bigger plants. Uh, they're going to create some different management issues uh, than the other type we'll talk about, which are determinant tomato plants, um, sometimes semi-determinant, uh, which is sort of the, the newer uh, typology, I guess. But uh, determinant tomato plants 
um, really kind of grow to a certain size and then make a more uh, dramatic transition from that vegetative growth stage to reproductive stage. Um, they don't spend a lot of energy in the later parts of their life continuing to grow uh, vegetatively. They dump more of that energy into reproductive growth. Um, the interesting thing, you know, if you're trying to decide between two plants, uh, you know, uh, indeterminate and a determinant, um, there's a lot of things you can do, but you know, how you manage that plant, your ability, the space you have is really going to make a big difference. Uh, but also, you know, if you plan on doing a lot of canning, determinants tend to set uh, fruit in a heavier load all at once. Um, so you have a lot more fruit at the same time. So if you want to can, that can be a good thing. If you just want to eat a, a tomato on your sandwiches throughout the summer, um, you know, having a bunch of fruit coming on all at once can also be kind of a bad thing. So when you're thinking between indeterminants and determinants, those might be some things to consider. So for fertilization, you know, again, all of these topics I'm talking about are really big topics. We could spend a lot of time on it. Um, so the, the best rule of thumb I can give you to start with about fertilization um, is go get a soil test, uh, take a test, uh, bring it to your local extension office, um, or you can mail it direct to the soil testing lab um, and they will come up uh, with recommendations based on what's already in your soil, what you need to add to that um, for tomatoes. Um, the reason that's important is you really don't want to overdo it. Uh, tomatoes are um, kind of sensitive to too much fertility, especially too much nitrogen. Um, if you over fertilize tomatoes, um, you can create a lot of really lush vegetative growth, uh, but actually kind of reduce some of your fruit yield. Um, so that can be a problem. There's also some other uh, issues we'll talk about in those common problems that can can sort of stem from or be exacerbated by tomatoes that are over fertilized. Um, so really, you know, if you want to fertilize your tomato plants, um, go out there, get a soil test, figure out how much you need to add, or maybe if you've got a, a rich garden soil already, you might not even need to add any at this point. Um, so really critical not to overdo it. Um, I will talk a little bit about when you get those recommendations, um, thinking about splitting up your application of that nitrogen fertilizer. Um, K-State uh, has a nice publication that was put together by Greg Eyestone, the Riley County Extension agent, uh, that talks about uh, side dressing vegetable crops. Um, so this is taking, you know, the total amount of nitrogen uh, you might want to add for your tomatoes for the season, and rather than putting all of that in prior to planting, like you probably want to do with your other nutrients, splitting that amount out. Um, and before your tomatoes start ripening, side dress a little bit of nitrogen. After picking your first ripe tomato, side dress a little bit of nitrogen. And then a month after that, add a little bit more. This will keep your tomato plants um, growing healthy throughout the season. Uh, the other nutrients are a little bit more stable in the soil. Um, so your risk of losing those, of those washing out of your soil isn't as great. So that's kind of why we do that nitrogen, split it up over time so that you know your plant always has nitrogen. If you put it all down at the beginning, um, you can easily lose some of it. It can wash out and uh, you know, then you wouldn't have any later in the season. So split application is something that we definitely kind of recommend for tomato plants. Um, irrigation, again, just a real you know, quick couple points on that, how to water tomatoes. Um, you you want to put the water uh, on the ground, not on the plant. Uh, Judy, in the second half of this talk, is going to talk a lot about disease issues. A lot of those are either, uh, maybe not caused by, uh, but exacerbated by, you know, leaf wetness. Um, so you want to try and keep your tomato plants as dry as you can. Um, so using a drip hose or a soaker hose is a good way to do that. If you just have one tomato plant and you're just using a hose and going out there and watering it by hand, trying to minimize how much you're splashing onto the plant and really just putting that water slowly into the soil at the base of the plant is kind of the goal. Um, some plants have sort of different cycles of when they really are, are thirsty. Uh, tomatoes, we really want to kind of keep watered evenly throughout the season. Um, so we don't want to start watering a lot more at any given point. As the plants get bigger, um, they obviously do need a little bit more water, uh, but we don't want to just start inundating them, especially once they start setting fruit. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that and some of the common problems. 
Um, if they do get this sort of big surge in watering, um, that can create problems. Likewise, if you don't water them enough, um, you can have some, some physiological problems with your fruits. Um, tomato plants do have pretty deep root systems, so you can water them deeply. Um, you know, maybe running that drip system or a soaker hose longer one day a week and really putting that water uh, down further into the into the the tomato plant's root system um, will be good. It can it can pull those that water up. Uh, likewise, if you water it deeply, it really encourages the tomato roots. Um, to, to reach down for that water. So if you let it dry out on the surface uh, between those waterings, um, that will, but you know, making sure there's still enough water down lower, um, that will help your, your plants grow. In general, the kind of rule of thumb is, you know, you want one inch to maybe one and a half inches when the plants are bigger of water per week. Um, so if you're getting that much in rain, you might not need to supplementally water your tomato plants. Um, but again, keeping that water even throughout the scene, the season is important. So if you get two inches of rain one week, um, you, you might even want to water them the next week just to make sure that they don't dry out because if tomatoes go through big fluctuations in the water, um, that can create problems for them. Um, there are some people that do what they call dry farming of tomatoes. Uh, it's a little bit hard in this part of the world just because we do get unpredictable rainstorms. Uh, but this is kind of growing tomatoes in a water restricted environment um, where you're watering them maybe a little bit less than I recommended, watering them less frequently. Uh, what that does is it really concentrates the flavor and some of those uh, phytochemicals in the fruit. Uh, so you get really richly flavored fruits. Um, but it is a challenge here because if you're trying to dry farm your tomatoes, um, unless you've got them in a hoop house or something, a greenhouse here, uh, and we get a rainstorm, uh, most of your tomatoes on the vine are probably going to split by that sudden influx of water. So that's why we kind of recommend even watering throughout the season, uh, even though there is, you know, some hype behind that idea of dry farming them. It's really hard in Kansas just with, you know, pretty seasonal or unpredictable rainfall. So we'll talk uh, pretty briefly about tomato support. Um, tomatoes do like to stay off the ground. It helps improve, you know, both the plant's disease resistance and the fruit quality. Um, so there's a number of different ways to do that. Uh, depending on what you're doing, there isn't really a right or a wrong way. Um, but cages are a really common way. So here's a couple of pictures of cages, one where you can see the cages and the others where you can see the tomatoes have just totally overtaken those cages um, that are, you know, about five feet tall. Um, there are plans, K-State has a nice publication on tomatoes uh, that has plans for how to make your own cages. In general, the, the tomato cages you see in hardware stores, um, or garden centers, um, you know, like the big box stores, uh, often are not adequate for the job, especially if you have an indeterminate tomato. You might be able to get away with a little kind of flimsy cages if you have a small determinate plant, but those indeterminate tomatoes, uh, they just get huge. Um, so you want to make probably your own cages or find a source of really substantial cages. Uh, these are made out of concrete reinforcing wire. Like I said, they're about five feet tall, so pretty big. Um, if you use cages, uh, you do want to support them. Um, so here's a picture of two rows of cages. Um, on the left there is some indeterminate tomatoes, and on the right is some determinate tomatoes. So you can see the cage on the right side kind of sticking out. Um, and I put this in here just because um, this row of tomato cages had a few T posts and some wire holding it up, uh, but with Kansas winds that really wasn't enough for those big indeterminate plants and it just blew the whole row over um, in a windstorm. So if you are using cages, especially if you have like big indeterminate plants, you want to make sure those cages are secured uh, in a way that will keep them upright. Um, another system that's really commonly used is called stake and weave. Um, so this is just using uh, posts. Usually every two or three plants, you will have a post. Um, and then by running twine around each side of the tomato plant, um, you basically kind of build a, a real narrow support system. So you're kind of building a, a wall or a fence of tomatoes. Um, so as those plants grow, um, you want to add another layer of twine every 12 inches or so of growth. Um, so you can kind of see that here. Um, the tomato plants are growing. There's about three plants in between those posts. Um, and then there's 
a piece of twine on each side of those plants and then another piece of twine 12 inches up um, and just kind of building support. Uh, this is one of those areas where that distinction between determinant and indeterminate tomatoes is really pretty critical um, because if you have indeterminate tomatoes, um, you're going to have a hard time growing them with stake and weave just because those plants are going to get so big. Um, you will have to prune them pretty aggressively. Uh, but if you have determinant tomatoes, they deal with this pretty well. Um, tomato cages do tend to, to give you a little bit more yield just because the plants have a little bit more space. Uh, when you do the stake and weave, you're kind of compressing those tomato plants down, um, limiting airflow a little bit, um, not allowing them to grow quite as freely. Uh, but it is a great way if you don't want to store a bunch of cages over the winter. Um, you, it takes up a lot less space when you're not using it. Uh, here's another picture kind of from the end of a row. Um, these are pretty tall T posts here. I think these are about eight feet tall, um, but these are determinate tomatoes. They're just very uh, well fed determinate tomatoes. So determinate tomatoes can get big, um, but if these were indeterminates, they'd probably be growing over the top of those posts. Um, there is one other type that's not super commonly used in gardens. It's really commonly used in greenhouses and that's called a string trellis. Um, if you do have some sort of overhead support, an arbor or something like that, uh, that's pretty substantial because these plants end up weighing a lot, uh, you can drape a string down and basically you just wrap that string around the, the stem of the plant um, or you can clip you know, the plant to those strings. Uh, this works well for indeterminate tomatoes, uh, but you will need to prune them pretty heavily to manage them in that way. Uh, but you can grow tall plants pretty healthy um, using this system. And so that brings me to the next topic. I've mentioned a couple of times here, pruning. Uh, this is something uh, a lot of home gardeners don't do, but something that can be pretty useful. Uh, so why do we prune tomato plants? Uh, first off, uh, we wanna improve airflow. Um, we want to keep the plant size manageable if you are growing some of those big indeterminate tomato plants. Uh, doing some pruning can help keep that plant a little bit more manageable size. Um, and it does kind of keep the plant focused on reproductive growth, growing those fruits. Um, so uh, limiting some of that vegetative growth, keeping it focused on reproductive growth. Uh, there's a, a few different things you can do for pruning. Um, so for all types, determinate or indeterminate, um, once they have grown up enough and they start setting fruit, there will be that first cluster we call the first fruiting hand. Um, at that point, if you remove the leaves that are below that, um, that will be good increasing airflow around the base of the plant, which is important. Um, so that works well for indeterminate or determinants. If you have an indeterminate plant, um, some people will do what we call suckering. Um, so there's an image of that where it shows in between the main stem and one branch, they're sort of in that internode. Um, another thing that will come out, a lateral sucker. Um, and if you prune that off, it will keep the plant focused on growing those main stems. Um, there's what we also call Missouri pruning, um, which is you're still removing that sucker, but you're letting a couple leaves grow out of it just to increase the leaf area of the plant. Um, so this really keeps those indeterminate plants a little bit more manageable, keeps them focused on a few growing points. So that's something people do. Um, there is also something you can do called topping tomato plants, uh, which is about four weeks, four or five weeks before you think you're gonna have your killing frost, so ending your tomato season. Um, if you cut the, the growing ends, so the ends of those vines, those main vines that are growing, um, that will again kind of get your plant to really focus on growing fruits, uh, putting the nu nutrients into the fruits rather than continuing its vegetative growth uh, all the way to that killing frost. So you can do that topping at the end of the season. Um, so another practice that's really important, mulching. Um, so why do we want to mulch? Uh, it, it does a great job for weed control if you provide enough mulch um, to limit those weeds. It can help with moisture management, so it keeps the, the soil moisture a little bit more even, like we talked about. That's really important uh, for tomatoes. Um, it can help with some disease prevention, so it keeps soil from splashing up onto our plants quite as much. There's a couple of different options. So you can use an organic mulch or something that's a, a natural byproduct, I guess. Um, so on the top there, you see that's actually grass clippings they're using. You can use grass clippings if they've dried out some and you haven't used any herbicides that would impact your plants on that grass. Um, or you can use straw or other things like that. 
Um, if you do that, you want to wait until the soil warms up, which is about the time we're in now would be a good time to start applying those organic mulches. If you use plastic mulches, like in the bottom picture, there's some landscape fabric there. Um, you do want to apply those earlier because those will actually start warming the soil faster. That black plastic will transmit heat down into the soil. Uh, so you don't need to wait for the soil to warm up to use those. Um, either of those two systems will provide those benefits um, that we talked about with mulching. Um, it's just kind of up to you which you choose. Uh, so we'll talk really briefly about harvest. Here you see a, a cluster of tomatoes at sort of all stages of ripeness. Um, one thing that's, that's often overlooked in harvesting at the garden level um, is people sometimes wait longer than they have to to harvest tomatoes. Um, so here you see the USDA's color classifications. Um, if you pick a tomato when it's green and that far left classification, it will ripen off the vine, but it's not gonna taste very good. If you pick one when it's at that breaker stage, um, it will taste a lot better than a green one, but maybe a little bit less good than if you waited all the way till it was red. But beyond this point where the tomato is kind of turning, so it's getting a little bit, you know, more, more than 10%, but less than 30% have that kind of blush, I guess is the tef technical definition there. Most of the the, the sugars and the chemicals that create the flavor in that tomato are already in the tomato um, and it's kind of sealing off its connection to the vine. So it's going to go ahead and ripen and the flavor is going to be good. Um, and that can be important, you know, if you're losing your tomatoes when they get all the way to red ripe to squirrels or other things like that, um, you can pick them earlier and ripen them on your countertop um, and, and miss out on some of those damaging incidents, I guess. We'll talk really briefly about pest control. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to talk about what chemical to use for what insect, but just some broad general guidelines on how to do this best. Well, pests are attracted to plants that are under stress. So minimizing plant stress is really important. You know, making sure your plant has enough water throughout the growing season, uh, making sure you fertilized it adequately can help minimize that stress. Contrary, if you add too much fertilizer, that can actually attract some pests. So good cultural practices, um, doing some of these techniques, you know, having cages or staking, getting some pruning to get airflow, uh, that can make the plants less attractive to pests. Um, if you clear weeds out of the area, that provides less habitat for some of those pests. Um, so maintaining good cultural practices in the garden is a great way to help manage pests. You do want to keep your eyes open and watch for signs of infestation. If you are going to treat, you want to only use properly labeled products. Make sure it says you can use it on garden vegetables or tomatoes on the label. Um, and be careful of over application of broad spectrum insecticides. Uh, so what you see on the right there, that tomato that I'm holding, um, that is, has been damaged by a stink bug poking little holes in there and sucking out the juices. You can see those white things. Um, there is a, a picture there of K-State's got a good publication on insect and mite pests of vegetable gardens. Um, so if you wanna go into more of those details, that's a great thing to reference. Um, we also have a, a good publication on tomato and tobacco hornworm, um, which is the, the big guy you see up there on the right. Um, if you see those on your plants, uh, you'll most likely notice them after the tops of your plants look kind of like that bottom picture. So they'll eat your, your tomato plants down to little sticks. Um, they are big, like the size of my finger if you let them get full size. Uh, the easiest way to manage them is just look, keep your eyes out um, and pick them off. If you have chickens, they love to eat them. Another real common problem uh, is spider mites. Uh, here you can see some heavily impacted plants um, and then a little microscopic picture of spider mites because they're pretty hard to see with the naked eye, um, but they create kind of blotchy stippling on your leaves. Um, and these can really be a problem. Uh, this is one of the reasons I said don't over apply those insecticides because if you do that, um, you're really going to be, especially the broad spectrum ones, you can be killing the beneficial insects um, that will be protecting those uh, spiders or, or protect eating those spider mites, excuse me, not protecting spiders. All right, we'll run through a few common problems really quickly here. Uh, so blossom end rot is one we see really commonly about this time of year or when you first get your fruit set. It is caused by a deficiency of calcium in the fruit, not necessarily in your soil. So if your plant has an underdeveloped root system, you might have enough calcium in your soil, but it's not taking it up. 
Um, if you're not watering it evenly, again, that can sort of exacerbate that problem. Um, if you over fertilize and you have too much lush succulent growth, that can deprive the fruiting parts of some of the calcium it needs. Um, and this to me, I, I think is really especially common if you grow those plum or Roma tomatoes. Um, if you do have this, it usually, your plants kind of grow out of it. So um, it usually is a problem right when they first start fruiting. Um, and then maybe the second flush of fruit or so, uh, it will grow out of that. Um, but it, you won't have this problem nearly as much as if you keep that water even um, as it's transitioning from that vegetative to reproductive stage, it just has a harder time uh, distributing that calcium. Another common problem here, fruit cracking. Um, so the bottom one is caused by a nice almost ripe fruit that then got a massive dose of water. So a big rainstorm came through um, and that fruit just instantly swells and cracks. Uh, the other kind of cracking there is actually caused uh, by that plant, again, growing too lush. Uh, so the plant kind of grows too quickly, a problem of over fertilization, you can get those top radial cracks. Um, Cat facing, you'll see this on tomatoes sometime. It's a result of poor pollination. Um, it can be a result of cold damage if you're really early in the season, if you planted your tomatoes a little bit too early, um, but something that maybe having more pollinator support can help with. Uh, blossom drop, I get a question about this all the time. Um, once our temperatures get high, uh, blossoms will drop off rather than pollinate. Um, so daytime highs may be above the 90s and nighttime lows in the upper 70s or above um, will cause those blossoms to drop off and not set fruit. Um, there are some varieties you can choose called hot set varieties, which will help with that. Um, but if you just keep your plant alive, it will recover when those temperatures drop down and start setting fruit. So often we get a peak in fruit production um, you know, between July and August when the early cooler season has set fruit, our production kind of drops off here in August uh, because the fruit that would have set in July probably didn't because it's often too hot, but then it rebounds again in the fall. Um, there's also physiological leaf roll, um, which is common this time of year as plants kind of make that transition um, from vegetative to reproductive growth and also as it starts getting hot for the beginning of the season. Plants leaves will kind of roll. It's a natural thing. Um, it isn't really something to worry about. But so that's the picture on the left. If you look at the picture on the right, that is something to worry about. So that's herbicide damage uh, caused by uh, either 2,4-D or dicamba herbicides, which are commonly used in lawn products um, and that can drift over uh, and hurt your tomato plant. So that plant uh, has extreme leaf rolling uh, which is a sign of herbicide damage. K-State does have a bunch of great resources uh, to refer to. Um, so you can go to our website bookstore.ksre.ksu.edu um, and look at all those resources. There's more information on everything I've talked about today and more. Um, if you have questions, feel free to send me an email. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Judy. Okay, we are going to go ahead and switch over to uh, Judy O'Mara to talk about diseases. So it looks like uh, she's working on that. Uh, just give us a couple seconds and we'll be good to go. All right, am I on? Uh, Rebecca, can you hear me? You're, you're good, Judy. You can go. Sorry, thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, Tom did an awesome job just talking about the, the culture and the types of tomatoes. And I feel a little guilty uh, taking such a large period of time just to talk about uh, plant problems. But if anybody grows tomatoes, they pretty much live with disease. And so I, I'm going to focus uh, primarily on diseases and specifically one, but I wanted to just quickly point out another resource that's one of my favorites that I go to uh, almost on a daily basis. Certainly if you're out there in the state and you have a, a garden question or even a landscape question, I always recommend starting with the county extension office. But beyond that, if I'm looking for problem solving, I always go to the K-State uh, common a horticulture common pest problems page. It's got loads of stuff that's very useful. Uh, here, this is what everybody would like. The, the photo on the left is actually um, my sister 
<laughs> in New Mexico, she was showing me a picture of some of the tomatoes that they were growing, and she said like every third day they were pulling out uh, two or three uh, bins full of, of tomatoes, and she was thinking that her husband had planted a few too many plants. On the right, you can see some common fruit problems. So it can be kind of annoying to grow this awesome plant and then to develop issues. So the challenge when you have issues is to figure out what's going on. And I can see that when you have a tomato problem, uh, it can be a mystery. It can be a mystery. Sometimes the plant itself looks off color. Sometimes the fruits are affected. And so this is another case where when you're doing problem solving, going to the right resources and and really one of the best resources is your county county extension office so let's just talk tomato problems tom did a great job talking about some very common non-disease problems and so if i were uh picking my own top 10 list uh, i would actually put a disease at the very top uh, septoria leaf spot and and that's probably what i'm going to focus on a fair amount, but uh, you notice these other ones are more uh, physiological or weather or insect, and then disease falls again to the bottom. So if, if I were picking my own list, I would, if I were picking the top 10 of diseases, I'd probably put septoria in the top, I don't know, five, six slots, and then I would start putting other problems in. So let's just take a quick look. Oh, wait, wait. Um, just a quick disease tip. You know, when I first went to college like a million years ago, I happened to work with a farmer and he said something very uh, profound to me. And he said, oh, if you're gonna be a farmer, you have to be a weather watcher. And as I moved into plant pathology, I realized that's really true. So the quick tip for disease is, is it's very closely linked to weather. So if you have a really wet year, you're going to see more disease. If you have a very dry year, you're going to see less disease. So that, that would be, you could almost take an outlook of the growing season. And if we have consistent rainfall patterns, you may actually see diseases that are present be more severe. Uh, and if you have a great year where you have very little disease, it could be just because conditions are a bit drier. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later. More than that is I just want to highlight when we're actually talking about diseases, one thing to keep in the back of your mind is if you are planting into the same location every year, a lot of times the disease is surviving, maybe in the soil, but more likely in the debris in that location. So those are two things that are kind of a, a frame of reference. All right, here's the bane of my existence. <laughs> Uh, septoria leaf spot. Uh, it's a fungal disease and if you've ever grown tomatoes and you didn't know what this was, all you, all you knew was that the bottom of your plants turned brown and then as the season progressed, uh, it starts a little bit and then creeps up and gets a little bit more, a little bit more, so by the time you hit July or mid-July, it's maybe up halfway up the plant. It's almost like a slow-moving wilt but it's actually, um, it's a fungal disease, and it actually is, starts out as a leaf spot. So it, it starts out as a, a scattering of dark spots, they eventually coalesce together, and then they kill the stems. So the disease is, uh, is active during the growing season. At the end of the season, like last year, it will actually overwinter from the previous growing season, just in the leaf litter on the surface of the soil. It's definitely favored by warm, wet conditions. So the same conditions that favor the growth of the plant pretty much favor the, the, the activity of the disease. Uh, there is a little tip right here, and Tom mentioned it, and I thought it was a pretty good uh, highlight. It's actually about, when we're talking about diseases, they require a period of leaf wetness. And so what we mean by that is we just recently had rain and the water is on the surface of the leaf, but it's actually, if there's fungal spores present on the leaf, you have a film of water uh, surrounding that fungal spore. 
And for that disease to um, become active, germinate and become active, it usually takes a prolonged period of, of leaf wetness or a film of water around that fungal spore. So we're really looking at like six to 12 hours. So to manage this particular disease, um, you know, it kind of depends on which camp you fall into. <laughs> Uh, this is a disease that's pretty much worldwide. It's all the way across the U.S. and it's definitely anywhere we grow tomatoes in Kansas. So it would be great when we talk about managing uh, diseases in general, we always say, oh, if you have a chronic problem with a particular disease, do your best to pick a resistant um, variety. But with this disease, there's, there's no help in that arena there really isn't much that we can do from the perspective of resistance. So then that takes you back to uh, cultural practices and there's quite a few and with the cultural practices your goal is pretty much to keep your leaves dry and um, we'll, we'll focus on that in a minute and then definitely fungicides. So some people uh, are very comfortable using fungicides, some are not very comfortable um, what I can tell you is your cultural practices will help reduce it, but they won't get rid of it. So uh, if you're not comfortable using fungicides, a lot of people actually just increase maybe the number of plants that they grow. So they still get the end output that they're looking for. Cultural practices. So we, uh, one of the key ones that I think is rotation. With uh, septorial leaf spot, it's not that it's surviving in the soil in that location, it's really sort of in the debris that's left behind in that location. So if you plunk your tomatoes back into the same spot every year, then you have a ready made amount of disease that's present that just splashes up or blows back up onto the plant. So if you can, even if you have a small growing location, if you can kind of put it into a grid and then you know split to the other side, that will help a little bit. Uh, in, an, in a growing season for uh, diseases, not even just septoria, but diseases in general, start with healthy plants. I know that seems to make sense, but if you're at the garden center and they have a flat of plants for a buck, and you're like, what a great deal, I'll just fertilize them. Uh, I won't saying no, your best chances of success in getting a great crop is really starting with healthy plants. And in my mind, that's plants with a good green canopy and a nice healthy root system. So pop those plants out of the pots and take a look for good root volume and good color. Uh, other cultural practices, your goal is to reduce disease, you wanna reduce leaf wetness. And you can do that by providing good plant spacing, uh, caging or staking up your plants. And with the goal of that, is good airflow so that if you have a rainfall, the leaves will dry out pretty quickly. Uh, watering in the morning, so if you like to stand out there and water and you have a hand spray and you spray your tomatoes thinking, oh, well, the plant looks dry, it looks hot, I'm just going to miss the top of the plant. Well, re realistically, plants, you need to water the root system and not the top of the plant. Um, but even if you did, if you watered in the morning, the, the leaves would dry off pretty quickly. Uh, other cultural practices, Tom talked about mulching. The impact of mulching, oh, it's great. It does a lot of great things. Certainly it reduces, um, suppresses weeds, conserves soil moisture. But I mentioned that you've got that leaf litter that survives on the soil. So if you have a layer of mulch around the plant, it can actually prevent that um, splash or movement air blowing of the spores up to the lowest leaves. So super quick and super easy. Uh, you start out with healthy plants, you rotate your location. Um, we're talking septoria, the foliar diseases tend to break down over a one to two year period. Uh, so if you can rotate, if you grid your small garden area into four blocks and just kind of keep rotating into the next block over, you know, you'll have rotated out of that location and the disease that was present in there previously will break down. If you have a, di a different disease, some of the bacterial diseases will survive in the soil for three to four years. And so again, that longer rotation helps uh, reduce the disease in that location. So something like this, it doesn't take much, even if you have a very small uh, growing location, 
just moving from year to year into a separate spot will kind of help minimize the disease that's active out there. Uh, I tried to get a picture of tomato, but <laughs> this was uh, what I saw outside yesterday after the rain, and it just shows that the leaves are wet. And the idea is when the leaves are wet, if, this, if the fungal spores are present on the plant, the, the conditions are favorable for disease. So the goal is to kind of keep keep the leaves dry. So you can do that by improving your airflow. So here you can see in this location, it, the planting, it, the plants are very close and uh, there's a lot of foliage. So you might be able to space them a little bit more. Uh, definitely you're gonna wanna cage and stake and with the idea that you can improve the airflow through the foliage. Um, here, mulching, you can see uh, by contrast to the previous slide, these plants actually look pretty healthy. And I think one of the nice things that they're doing is they've got some mulch around the base of the plant and that can actually uh, reduce uh, some of the disease that moves up from the leaf litter up to the lowest part of the plant. All right, fungicides, to use them or not use them. Uh, I have to tell you, I, I um, don't bother to remember them. I just go look them up at the K-State Common Pest Problems. So there's some really, if you always want to know what the most current products are, and not only the active ingredient, but common, common trade names, uh, Word Up at the Horticulture uh, Common Pest Problems site does a great job of providing that information. So definitely there are products available if you fall into the camp where you feel comfortable using them. So I've spent most of my time talking about septoria, septoria leaf spot, and I would say this is the number one disease problem that anybody who grows tomatoes has to, to fight on an annual basis. More severe in a wet year, less severe but still present in a dry year. But there's a few other oddballs that I'm gonna just like browse through uh, before it's our Q&A time. So if you've ever had um, plants that are off color, maybe wilty looking, stunted, that very first uh, photo that I showed of mystery problems, uh, I'm a big fan of post-mortems at the end of the season. So there is a disease called root knot nematode and with root knot nematode, it's a, a microscopic, um, microscopic non-segmented worm, and it's you can't really see them with your eyes. They're in the soil. Root knot nematodes have a very wide host range, but what they do when they feed on the roots is they cause this sort of swelling on the root system. So that swelling on the root system causes a deformity uh, to the root system and reduces water uptake and nutrients. So what you will see when you're looking at the tops of the plants, you won't necessarily know that you have a problem with root knot nematode, but the plants just don't grow very well. And since the nematodes are, have, occur in a hot spot in that location, every year if you plant back into the, that location, uh, they just don't grow very well. So at the end of the season, my suggestion is when you're pulling your plants out to clean up your garden, go ahead and take a look at the root system and see if they're healthy. If you ever see the roots where they look kind of swollen, uh, there's, there's nothing else that really looks like that. That's root knot nematode. So once you know you've got that in your location, you pretty much know that you've got it forever. Uh, and once you have it forever, uh, the, the management is really going to be through the use of resistant varieties. So when you're picking your uh, tomato varieties, you would pick varieties that have a code on them that says VFN and the N stands for resistance to root knot nematode. So this one's a bummer but it's also manageable with the use of, of resistant varieties. Another tomato virus, another tomato disease that maybe you've seen in your gardens, I've had it before. Uh, it looks kind of interesting. You may not really notice it on the plant itself. It does cause some um, sort of a purplish black flecking on the leaves, but it's, it's and maybe a, an off color to the plant, but it's not that noticeable. Where you really notice it is when you see the fruits. So this is tomato spotted wilt virus. And this virus is 
uh, spread by thrips. So a really tiny little insect that's got wings, and if you have an infected plant, there's some potential for it to move from the infected plant to nearby plants. So the management for this disease is actually pretty simple. If you see fruits that start showing up where you have rings on the fruits, you just remove those uh, infected plants or those symptomatic plants. I think I just have maybe one more and then we'll just stop for our questions. I was, was going to say, I think we've got enough questions that we will pretty much fill the remaining time if you want okay, to stop that's, there, Okay, thank you, Rebecca. Let me uh, share back. Thanks. Okay. So um, I know that Pam has been copying and pasting all of the questions from the chat into a Word document. And her goal uh, is to, uh, we'll get as many answered by Tom and Judy as we can during the remaining time. And then they will uh, go through and answer the remainder of those questions and post them to the website where the recording is linked as well, uh, just to get any other questions uh, answered that we don't have time for. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to you, Pam, to start throwing some questions out. Okay. We had a few questions about small plants that are blooming already. Um, is it best to remove any of those flowers or that small fruit, or is it okay to leave them? I, I think in general, it's, it's okay to leave them. Your, your plants will catch up. Uh, so I, that, that'd be my opinion. I'm not sure of a lot of, of research on that one way or the other. Uh, you, your plants will probably spend a little bit more time growing leaves if you pull those off, uh, but uh, I think they'll catch up pretty quick either way. Okay. I'm just going to go down the list here. Um, we've had a few of our tomatoes and peppers cut off the base of the stem. Looks to be the work of cutworms. Is this possible and what can I do? Yeah, I would say that definitely sounds like cutworms. Um, so you can uh, put your plants in, you know, sometimes people use uh, old toilet paper, paper tubes around their plants just to prevent the, when they're little, just to prevent the uh, cutworms from getting access all the way around the stem, um, but some way to, to exclude those. But yeah, that definitely sounds like cutworms to me. Okay. And there were a few questions about adding eggshells and ashes and Epsom salts. Yeah, that's really um, an area where, you know, my first recommendation would, would be to get a soil test. Um, you can certainly add those things. You know, if you're adding wood ashes to your garden, um, you're, they do have nutrients in there, but you're going to be raising the pH. Um, at least where I'm from, most of the non-agricultural soils already have a high pH. Um, so you probably don't want to add those unless you're doing something to control for that. So a good, a good soil test will tell you that. Um, for the other things, eggshells, you know, that will add some calcium over time. Those will break down very slowly. So you're not going to see an immediate boost from that. Um, like I, I hope I conveyed often with blossom end rot, which is like the calcium deficiency. The problem isn't that our soils are deficient in calcium. It's just that your plant at that time is having a hard time getting enough of it to the fruit. Um, so again, that's something you can test for if you kind of consistently throughout the season have problems with blossom end rot. Uh, I might recommend testing uh, for calcium, uh, but I don't think that's terribly common um, but you could add those eggshells to kind of build that over time. Um, but yeah, for any any kind of soil additive, I think your first step should be to get a soil test. Uh, like I said, you know, tomatoes um, are are somewhat sensitive to over fertilization with nitrogen. Uh, nitrogen is something that moves through your system pretty quickly, uh, your soil system. Um, so you you can probably plan on adding some every year, uh, but if you have a really rich soil, um, it's easy to add too much, so. Get and there are, there are a few questions about herbicide damage. Yeah. Is it okay to leave them and will they recover? Um, whether they will recover or not is a, a good question. If you have a little bit of herbicide damage, um, they will probably recover. If you have a lot, they probably won't. Um, so you can leave them um, and they will grow. Uh, then the, the challenging part of answering that question is, um, 
I really, if you have herbicide damage to your plant, I, I couldn't safely uh, say that the, the fruit on that is uh, safe to eat because it is an off-label application of an herbicide, basically. Um, so I, I can't officially answer, you know, whether it's safe to eat, but plants do grow out of it They, if you have a, a sort of light incidence of it. If they're really small, Tom, my observation is at this early in the season, a lot of times the damage is enough that the plants just sit there. They don't die, they stay green, but they never grow. So it might be better just to run out and start over because there's still time. Yeah, and that, that is something I, I meant to talk about in my talk and it kind of slipped my mind, um, but it's not too late to plant tomatoes. So if you got inspired, you want to try something else, it, you can still go out and plant them. I also didn't talk about planting at all because really the big caution on that is don't plant them when the soil's cold, but statewide our soil should be nice and warm. So go ahead and plant some more or replace ones that are damaged. Okay, I'm going to jump to some questions for Judy too here. Um, would it be advisable to use fungicides proactively? Uh, I generally say no. Uh, usually you, you wanna wait till you see your first symptoms showing up and then start on a, on a spray program. Okay. And can you recommend any natural fungicides? That's a great question. Um, I totally blinked. So uh, Go for it, Tom. Yeah, I was going to say it, it depends on what you're trying to treat specifically, and I don't remember what lines up with what, um, but the, the fungicides approved for organic production usually um, are a copper formulation. Um, there is also a, a bicarbonate that will be um, for some things. I'm trying to think, I think that's mostly powdery mildew, so not a huge problem on tomatoes. So coppers would be an option. Yeah. And anything you could treat with sulfur, um, there are some sulfur fungicides that are natural, oh. I guess. And then recommendations for rotating when you have a small garden. You you may not be able to rotate. So uh, the main thing is, even if you go back into the same location, use your other cultural practices, uh, good spacing, caging, staking, um, you know, watering in the morning, uh, and I, something I didn't have a chance to mention is at the end of the season, uh, rather than composting plants that are already infected, uh, just don't compost your tomatoes and that'll kind of help reduce your disease load in the area. Okay. And then how about using di diatomaceous earth tilled into the soil? Will that help with nematodes? I don't have an answer for that. That I'd have to do some research on, but if I get an email, I can look into it and respond. Okay. And now I'm just going through some of the ones that have come up since then. Um, how about trimming or pruning the tomato, the tomato plants? Um, do you recommend trimming the bottom leaves up from the ground about 12 to 24 inches to improve airflow at the base? Yeah, that's kind of um, what I was talking about when I say to that first fruiting hand, it tends to, to be about that height off the ground. Um, but that is really kind of the most critical thing for either those indeterminants or the determinants is that space right around the ground. Um, a lot of the, the splashing and those other issues Judy talked about, you can minimize by doing that pruning. And actually for myself, I always, once I start seeing disease develop, I just prune out the, those bottom leaves that are already scorched out to reduce the amount of disease that's present just to kind of slow it down. Okay. And then we have one where they um, had confirmed fusarium wilt a few years ago. So aside from soil solarization, plant rotation, and choosing resistant varieties, are there any other things that they can do? Uh, I would say no. I'd say their best bet is to use resistant varieties, which will allow them to continue to grow in that location. And then on Tom, one of your slides had red tomato trays. Red tomato trays. Are I'm those not... effective? Maybe like the to the red mulch, the plastic mulch. Oh yeah. Um. So so red plastic mulch uh, is proven effective. I'm blanking on the the percentage that's shown up. I think it's about a, a 10 to 15 percent yield bump, um, if you plant those tomatoes in red plastic mulch. 
Um, it's not super commonly available, but it's around some places. And uh, I've tried it once. It, you know, I, I didn't end up feeling like it was worth the additional expense, but you know, it, it does in research trials has been proven out to be effective. Okay. And then recommendations for tomato varieties for beginners. I think it depends on what kind of tomato uh, tomatoes you like to eat. Um, that last slide with my email I put up there, those are Juliet's, um, which is an All-American Selections winner. It's my favorite tomato to grow. Um, they're very prolific. Uh, they're kind of a grape tomato. Um, pretty, they don't have any disease resistances listed that I know of, but they're, as a plant, pretty resistant to disease in general. Um, and they taste good. Uh, they're a little bit drier, so good for cooking too. So a good all around tomato. But if you're wanting slicers, you know, for sandwiches, there'd probably be a different recommendation than. Okay. Um, Rebecca, we're reaching one o'clock. Do we want to do more questions or? Um, I think in the interest of ending on time, we should call it a day. Um, and again, any questions that haven't been answered, we'll get the answers to those posted on the website. Uh, thanks for everyone for joining the uh, K-State Garden Hour this week. And I look forward to seeing many of you available and here next week as well. Thanks, everybody.